Um, welcome to the purposelessness of paying uh, Lindsay Model class. Um, I am I'm so excited about this class. Um, I have been thinking about doing this class for years. Um, so this is a product, I, I was telling a couple other people about this. This is probably my favorite soapbox. Uh, the problem of evil, sin, suffering, pain. I, I love it. I, I eat this stuff up. Um, as an undergrad uh, philosophy major at Taylor, I took an entire 12 week class just on the problem of evil. And then I took that, uh, those ideas and I synthesized them in my thesis, taking another uh, 12 week class on apologetics. Um, at seminary, I, I, every chance I get, I write papers and I focus my study on the problem of evil, um, this man's relationship with sin and suffering and where death fits into to God's narrative of salvation. Um, so this is, this is definitely something I am incredibly passionate about. Um, I have taken everything you know, that I've kind of gathered over the years and have been taught and have read and put it together, and I think I've got a pretty good plan for how these next six weeks are going to go. Um, I'll be taking a lot of material uh, from this book, God and Evil. It's kind of like an anthology, just a bunch of essays uh, by multiple different theologians from a bunch of different denominations and, and faith backgrounds uh, that have to do with that. I will also be taking kind of um, my philosophical framework will be developed from this book. I highly recommend it. If you have any desire to read a book on theology, this is the place to start. Excellent book. Uh, the Domestication of Transcendence by William Plaker. Highly recommend that. And then uh, some stuff from Kierkegaard, and then of course Luther and Erasmus talking about the bondage of the will, and that will come up in week three. Um, so this is going to be, as you kind of have gathered, a systematics treatment of the problem of evil. Now uh, systematics is an area, a study of theology, that looks at uh, broad topics. So instead of just doing uh, what we call exegetical theology, which is where we walk through a text and pull ideas out, Systematic theology takes an idea and looks at scripture and looks at church history, looks at what we believe and says, um, all right, so what's the conclusion? So this systematic class will be taking a look at pain, look at suffering, look at sin, all right? We've got a lot of ground to cover today. We're going to cover a bit of history. We're going to talk about what the problem of evil is. If we don't know what we're going to be talking about the next six weeks, it's, it's useless. So we've got to get that nailed down. And then we're going to take some time underneath the so what to apply this and to look at how this problem of evil fits into our daily lives. Um, and then we'll, we'll, bind, we'll wrap everything up kind of with a conclusion and a pointing ahead to what we're going to be studying in this class. Um, fair warning, this is not going to be a, a fun class for some of you. Um, my goal is to make you really uncomfortable. My goal is to maybe make you think about questions that you've never even thought of before. My goal is to kind of upset and unsettle maybe some preconceived ideas about sin, about pain, about evil. But I want to make crystal clear, I do this because I care. I'm not just a, uh, a guy who likes to see people squirm or laugh, like a guy who likes to see people uh, become really uncomfortable with their faith. No. I have this really weird idea that truth is what brings true comfort. And my goal is to give you truth at the end of these six weeks. I don't want you to hang on your hope on a lie, a misunderstanding about evil. I want, you to, I want us to wrestle with the problem. I want us to take it honestly and, and look at it um, with an objective eye um, along with Job and along with many other characters in our, our scriptures, all right? That's what this class is about. All right. Um, so let's dive right in. I want to cover the first two sections, a bit of history and the meat of the matter, fairly quickly, and then we'll dive right into the so what and apply this to our lives. Any questions as we get started? Any clarification we can give? Did I start the video? Yes, I did start the video. Thank you. Tim. Appreciate that. That would not be the first time I would have forgotten this. So. Okay. All right. A bit of history. So what is the problem of evil? Um, well, first, let, let's take a look back. Let's take a step back and say, where, when did the problem of evil come onto the scene? When did the problem of evil start becoming a thing that people talked about? All right? Well, it goes back over 300 years before Christ was born. Uh, about 300 BC, the Greek philosopher Epicurus, E-P-I-C-U-R-U-S, Epicurus, 
Uh, Epicurus is a, is a Greek philosopher, as I mentioned. He is the one responsible for founding the, the philosophical school of thought called Epicureanism, which takes a look at um, uh, pleasure and pain and sees that the diminishing of desire and the limiting of suffering is the ultimate goal of the human life. Right? So to kind of get him started in that Epicurean line of thinking, Epicurus made a baffling argument. He kind of came up with something that really blew people out of the water. He said that everything that we thought we knew about who God was, now remember this is Judeo-Christian God, but it's also the Greek pantheon, this is God in general. Everything we thought we knew about divine beings is incompatible with the existence of evil. Epicurus looked at who God was, who we said God was, and then he looked at evil in the world. He looked at pain and suffering and death and said, you know what, those, those two don't really line up. Epicurus' thinking permeated Christian culture. Um, it really influenced a lot of early scholars that we'll be talking about, specifically uh, Thomas Aquinas, and also, uh, more importantly for our discussion, um, St. Augustine. Um, but the, the problem of evil did not come to a head. It came to a, a boiling point until the 18th century, right? So 18th century history buffs, what what's, comes to mind when you hear 18th century as far as um, reason and, and the progression of, of logical problems? Mm -hmm. Enlightenment, exactly right. So the Enlightenment is, is uh, catching up steam, and in the 17th century, the Enlightenment is going full tilt, right? So the Enlightenment, remember, came after the Reformation. Really, a response to the Reformation. Um, a lot of the Enlightenment ideas were caused by the Reformation. Uh, people looked at philosophers and, and academics, looked at the war caused by denominational disagreement. They looked at the Thirty Years' War, and they said, this is absolutely disgusting. What is going on with religion? And they started looking at ways that life could be thought of outside of a religious worldview. And they came up with the grand scheme of things. They came up with theories of ethics. They came up with um, systems in which God did not exist. Here we have uh, great thinkers like Nietzsche and Hegel and Derrida all coming from this idea of the Enlightenment, all tasked with this job of creating a system of thinking that doesn't have room for God, all right? So that's the Enlightenment. In the 18th century, the Enlightenment philosopher David Hume, David Hume asked this question again. And he breathed new life into one of the greatest theological debates of history. The greatest theological debates of history is this problem of evil. Uh, this is a serious um, issue for academics, for theologians, for philosophers. Um, a lot of, I've, I've had a good friend actually uh, deny the faith because of the problem of evil. This it, it, is a serious, serious thing, all right? And he is the one who's responsible for really kind of bringing it into the modern way of thinking and really kind of uh, giving Epicurus uh, a, a modern stage in which to, to present his ideas, all right? So, that's kind of the background of the problem of evil, kind of a brief overview. Let's dive into what the problem of evil actually is. So this is the meat of the matter. What is the problem of evil? Well, it's a logical argument, all right? So it's, it's basically logic that comes up with the problem of evil, right? So in its simplest form, the problem of evil can be outlined as follows. And in the following outline, um, these are each premises, all right? So we have uh, three premises, and the conclusion is um, unnumbered. It's, it's kind of up to the, to the uh, person who is examining the premises to come up with the actual conclusion, right? So the first of our premise is that God is omnipotent. God is omnipotent. That's number one. God is, is omnipotent, isn't he? Yes, good, that's what we believe. It's one of the uh, omnis, right? So we have omniscience, we have omnipresence, we have omnipotence. God is all-powerful. <coughs> God can literally do anything. There is nothing outside of the realm of possibility for God to exercise his power, his control, his authority. There is nothing that he cannot do. He is omnipotent. He has power, he has strength, he has the capacity for um, action, unlike anything that we've ever experienced before. God is omnipotent. That is a true thing that we Christians believe about God. Correct? Good. Number two, 
God is benevolent. God is benevolent. God is benevolent, isn't he? He's good. He loves us. God is a good God. We take benevolence out of our theology, and we have something that's not God anymore. God is fundamentally, purely good. And how do we know that? Where can we look? The cross. Exactly right. We look at the cross and we see that not only is God love, but God is self-giving love. God is love that sacrifices himself for the sake of the ones he loves. God is benevolent. That is fundamentally true. There is no malice. There is no evil. There is no um, any deceit in who God is. God is benevolent. <coughs> true statement. All right. Number three. Evil exists. Evil exists, doesn't it? We on board with that? Evil is evil is a thing. Uh, we saw what evil does down in Florida uh, this past week. We see what evil does each and every day in our own lives. Evil is a thing. We're not Christian scientists or um, curious who would look at evil and say, it's just something that's in our head. It's not really uh, a, a thing. It's just an attitude about certain events. And what we need to do to overcome evil is just get our heads in, in the right order. And we can see evil as, as being what it is, which is actually good. So, no, Christians are honest with what evil is. And we look at evil and we say, that's bad. And, and we can say that is bad because God says it's bad. Right? God is the one who declares evil to be a privation of his good. God is the one who declares evil to be something that is a departure from his good plans, his good intentions for his creation. God is the one who has established our definition of what it is uh, that evil exists. All right? um, St. Paul writes that death is the last enemy to be overcome. We talked about that in the Hope class. Uh, death is an evil thing. It is, it is bad. Evil exists. We cannot deny that. And Christians are, are comfortable saying that is true. Evil exists, right? So, we have three premises, three statements of fact. God is omnipotent. God is benevolent. Evil exists, right? Our three premises. These three truths led Hume to ask the following questions. Number one, is he, God, willing to prevent evil but not able? Okay, so humans, the human's thinking, and he's looking at evil, and he's looking at who God is. He says, well, evil certainly exists. So God, he is benevolent, that's true. He must be willing to stop evil, but because there's evil, that means that he's not able to. You guys see the logic of Hume's argument there? All right. Then he is impotent. Number one, that's the blank there. Is he, God, willing to prevent evil, but not able? Then he is impotent. <laughs> Number two. Is he able, but not willing? <clears throat> Does he have omnipotent power? Is he capable of doing anything he wants, but not willing to do that? But not willing to stop suffering, but not willing to stop death, but not willing to stop evil. Well, then he is malevolent. If God is both able to stop evil, and he is also willing to stop evil, whence then is evil? Whence, meaning from where does it come? If God is truly powerful, if he can truly do anything that he wants, and if what he wants is truly the good for his creation, if what he wants is truly goodness, not evil, and God says this, I desire not the death of my people, where does evil come from? God? Well, then he's not benevolent. 
if evil comes from God, then God isn't good. From man. From man? All right, hold on to that thought. Hold on. Yeah, sin? Yeah, that's what Pastor answered and said the answer was last week, right? Uh, sin, that's the cause of evil? That sounds like a good Christian answer. All right, let's, let's, let's put a pin in that. Let's, let's hold on to that. Um, Hume, Hume didn't want to solve it that easily. Hume said that if God is truly omnipotent, if God is truly benevolent, then evil would not exist. Evil exists. Therefore, God is either not omnipotent or God is not benevolent. You guys see that? All right. Hume's conclusion is that the God of Christianity is dead. If God is not omnipotent, if God is not benevolent, then God as we know him to be is just dead. Check a pulse. No, he's gone. And Egypt picked up on this idea and ran with it, right? We have, who has killed God? We have killed God. We have killed God with our, our rationality, with our minds. We have gone beyond the uh, Judeo-Christian worldview. We have gone to something greater. We can actually come up with a theory of existence that denies God, and we are our own gods. That's what the Enlightenment did to philosophy. That's what the Enlightenment did to culture and politics ever since the 18th century. So, the God of Christianity is dead. That's the conclusion that Hume reached based on his argument. Now that problem with evil, that's those three points, God is omnipotent, God is benevolent, God evil exists, that's the problem of evil in its most simplest form, all right? Uh, if you Google problem of evil, you can come up with some great articles. Um, the philosophical, uh, no, the Encyclopedia of Philosophy has a great article on it, but they have uh, 27 different premises, um, so it gets a little bit muddled. So these three are the problem of evil in its most basic form, all right? All right, so, so what? I mean, what, what do you guys think? What do you guys think about Hume's arguments? Uh, is it compelling? Is it, what do you guys think of the, the responses that a Christian would have? I've already heard of one, which is sin, but what do you guys think about that? Or maybe you have some other ideas? With, with flat linear thinking, that seems to make logical sense, but it doesn't accept that God has duality natures. Like, how can God be three persons in one? That doesn't, that defies logic. Therefore, God defies logic. Therefore, why could God also Okay, so if you're going from a purely rational standpoint, which adopts um, human syllogistic logic, then this argument makes sense. But your argument is that God is outside of logical constraints. Uh, just take a look at the Trinity, just take a look at the person of Christ, and we got some serious problems when it comes to human reason. So if God is outside of human reason in that regard, why isn't he outside of reason in, in this regard? God dealt with people on the cross. God dealt with evil on the cross. Okay, so that's God's solution to the problem of he, 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 he nailed it literally uh, down and, and dealt with it on the cross. Okay, good. What else? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, man, man is evil. Hume is proving that because the evil is in the creating of the doubt. And therefore, if you're creating the doubt, then that's the worm that gets your attention on yourself and not on Christ. Okay, so the origin of all evil is sin. The origin of sin is doubting God's word. And doubt, the origin of doubt, is man's own heart. So Hume's argument you're saying is proving that evil exists, but evil exists in man. It's outside of God's purview, basically. Right. Yeah. I mean, you think, look, look in terms of um, Darwin did the same thing. Uh -huh. Okay, he's the son of a pastor, for heaven's sake. Yeah. But um, here, he, through observation, well, he had nothing to go on, so he's doing this in his head. Yeah. And so as an evil person, you know, he's taking God out of the, the mix. Mm -hmm. And so now, everything you look at today is millions of years old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So take God out of the equation, take... Um, Man as the center of everything, and you've got some some pretty crazy conclusions that defy the logic of scripture. All right, so good. So the evil is it finds its origin, finds its root, and it finds its seed in man itself, not in God. All right, what else? Let's play devil's advocate here, but mm -hmm. if God created all things. Yeah. And there was nothing before God. Mm -hmm. How could there possibly be evil? 
Okay, good question. So uh, that is a, brings up an excellent point. If God is the creator of all things and evil exists, well, what then is evil? Doesn't God create evil? Uh, St. Augustine comes up with an excellent um, answer to this. Uh, he, he contends that because God is creator of all, and all things are created beings, then evil must not be a thing in itself. Evil is a privation, or a, a taking of the good thing and twisting it. Evil is not its own thing that God created, but evil is God's good creation, taking what God created and twisting it and making it bent in on itself. Uh, C.S. Lewis loves this language, Luther likes this language, it's actually quite scriptural, right? Satan, a fallen angel, Satan created good, but he fell. Evil uh, is in the garden, the garden is uh, God's good gift, the tree is God's good gift, an opportunity for his people to worship him through obedience, they take that and they twist it. So evil is not a thing in and of itself like goodness is. Evil is a privation or a twisting of God's reality. And so that's how that's how St. Augustine gets uh, from underneath um, the argument that God himself is the creator of evil, making God evil. Um, so that's, that's actually a really good argument because it starts with who God is, it looks at who God is, and then defines everything that we know to be true based on who God is. As, as Lutheran theologians, we, we try to follow this practice too. We don't look at experience and say, because of my experience with the world, God must be like this. We look at who God has revealed himself to be through his son, through his word spoken, through his word written, and we define our understanding of reality based on who God is. If something needs to give logically or, or rationally, we don't give up on who God has revealed himself to be. We give up on our understanding of whatever it is we're experiencing. So that's what Augustine is doing when he says that evil is a privation from a good thing, not a thing in and of itself. Yeah. I almost forgot what I was saying. We were saying, I think, the same thing, but in the, in the Garden of Eden, mm -hmm. of course, God is love. That God is love. <coughs> right. Uh, but it, it was Satan who, first of all, took that love that God had given to the angels yeah. and had twisted, like he said. Yep. And it, it twisted that love so now he loves self. Yep. And this is the same thing that happened to uh, Adam and Eve. Yeah. They had a love not for others and like God had, right. but then they twisted. Satan got them to twist it. Now they love themselves. Yes. And I, in my own mind, when you look around the whole world, that's what. No, I think the you're. Whole thing is. I think you're mm -hmm. spot on. I think uh, that sin is a love of self, putting your own needs before the needs of, God, uh, of others or the commands of, of Scripture. Yeah, and so uh, evil is not a, you know, a thing, but it's a, a twisting of what God gave us that is good, which is love. Great example of that. Good. All right, these are some good answers. So we have, you know, Jesus takes care of evil on the cross. We have evil is an origin inside of our own selves, not... God's fault, so God can still be omnipotent, God can still be benevolent, evil can still exist. Um, we have the, this whole syllogistic logical argument is, is based on logical assumptions that don't always apply to God, so we have to maybe be careful how seriously we take that. Anything else? What doesn't free will Free will? Okay, good. So um, that will be week two. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Um, Good, so we have some good answers. So, so the problem of evil, so what, right? It sounds like the conclusions that we've come to, the problem of evil is not really a problem at all. Um, it's mainly just a problem with academics and you know theologians who like to stay in their towers and not come out of them, right? Um, it seems like we've got some good answers to the problem of evil. Let's push back on those. Right? The problem of evil is not just an issue for philosophers or theologians. This is not just something for Epicurus to think about. It's not just something for Hume to write vast amounts of, of, uh, of literature about. This isn't just something that um, atheists <coughs> or, or agnostics struggle with. In its simplest form, the problem of evil can be reduced to one word. 
one word. Any guesses what that one word is? Why? Why? In its simplest form, the problem of evil can be reduced, be reduced to one word. Why? Why, God? Why sin? Why suffering? Why death? Why did she have to die? Why? Why? We don't need a logical argument with 28 premises to struggle with the problem of evil. If you've ever asked God why, you've wrestled and encountered the problem of evil. Uh, Peter Kreeft uh, wrote a book I didn't bring up uh, today, but he wrote um, The Problem of Suffering, The Problem of Pain. That's what it is. And uh, it's an excellent book, uh, especially the, the last chapter is, is amazing. But he, he makes the argument that the problem of evil, this is the third bullet point, this is a problem for anyone who has wept and wondered. The problem of evil is a problem for anyone who has wept and wondered. And then he goes on to say that weeping and wondering is a condition of every human being. The problem of evil is something that every single person has struggled with. I know that's really tough for you, Julia. Really it's hard. And there's me that stand up. Thanks, Mom. Could you move the stand for me? Thanks. For us today, the problem of evil can take on many forms. <coughs> and this is where it's starting to get to be uncomfortable. I am going to be ruthless. I'm really going to push back on, on the arguments for God that you've just made. Because this problem of evil, it's, it's your problem. It's my problem. Okay. For us today, the problem of evil can take on many forms. Give me some examples. Disease. disease. Problem of evil can manifest itself in disease. Uh, disease is a sort of uh, a subset of evil that we call natural evil. What are some other natural evils? We have disease, what else? Natural disasters. Natural disasters, hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunamis, volcanoes. Yeah. Famine. Famine, yes. Uh, drought, yeah. All, all really evil things that cause the suffering and death of, of God's creation. Well, we have death. The moment we're born, death is coming. Death itself, yeah. Death, death itself is a natural evil, right? You can't. You are born into a dying body, yeah. um, and that's that itself is an is a evil, evil thing. Good. Um, so that's natural evil. Um, what else? War. War? War, yeah. Um, modern wars pale in comparison to the, just the carnage and, and just awful nature of, of uh, ancient history. Uh, terrible, terrible acts of, of mankind. And that kind of represents, is a good representation of the other character, or the other facet of evil, which is moral evil. What are some other moral evils? Terrorism. Terrorism. Murder. Murder. Deception. Deception. Keep going. The mm. Ninety seconds, or every, or every minute, um, ninety babies are murdered in the United States alone. Uh, that's that's ones that we know of. Um, Across the world, that number is just mind-boggling. Humans are capable of terrible, terrible things. But we can, we can answer all those things by saying, man is the ultimate cause. We can look at natural evil and we can say, natural evil is the consequence that God gives for denying the way he intended the creation to go. Like there are consequences for action that are built into the world, and natural evil, we can kind of call that a consequence for, for evil. And these are the sorts of people that say, Katrina, well, that was God's you know, judgment on Bourbon Street, right? Those are those, that's the sort of logic that brings you to. So natural evil is God's judgment, God's punishment for moral evil. 
and we can answer moral evil, we can answer all these devastating things that humans are capable of by saying, well, that's just, that starts in our own hearts. That goes back to a twisting of God's good gift of love. That goes back to original sin and the original consumption of that fruit. We can answer those, but, but why the tree? Why did God put the tree there in the middle of the garden? If there had to be a tree, why couldn't he just put it someplace where they wouldn't find it? Why couldn't he put a big, you know, wire fence around it, or maybe a, 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 a you know, electric fence? He got zapped like a dog every time they tried to eat it. He gave us um, choice. Okay. He gave us um, what's the word I want? Free will. Free will. Free will is the, the same comment that was made earlier. So that would that would be an answer for that. So free will. Um, we exercise that free will. Um, exactly. Next week. Next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The only way I can show love to God. Yeah. The only way. Yeah. Is, is through obey, obedience. Yeah. And, love. and God in the beginning, there was no that, that was it. God gave mankind one law so that He could show love to him. Yep. Otherwise, mankind would not be able to show love to God. Sure. So that obedience to that tree, and that and it probably wasn't the tree. Yeah, so and you can't uh, and you can't show obedience and you can't obey if you don't have the option of contrary choice. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, and so that, comes, that comes through with true love. True love. Okay, okay, okay. That's fair. That's fair. You guys are hitting on something that I'm just gonna bring up in just a second. So let's let's put a pin in that again. All right. I'm delaying it. Okay. Um, so here's here's a question I have. For, for that answer. So maybe the tree was there so that we would have the option of evil, because if we don't have that option, we can't show true love. Um, and we, our parents just exercise that for some reason. Okay. What about Jesus? Jesus dying on the cross was not plan B. Jesus dying on the cross for the sins of the world was plan A. God did not look down and say, oh shoot, we get it. Jesus! <laughs> Jesus was the crucified Lamb of God from before there was a world. What? Well, we can flip it and say it's all about understanding and relationships with God. Yeah, everything, if you, you know, you have a free will to choose. And you also have a free will to go ahead and discuss with God and say, hey, but gives over here. Explain yeah. it to me. Well, that's true. That's true. But God knew that we were going to exercise our free will if that is true that we did. God knew it. And he still created. He still created a world in which there would be so much sin, so much death, that blood would really, literally run it down the streets in, in some cities after war has ravaged them. What is with God? He went into that situation knowing what mankind was going to do, and he knew what he was going to do about it. But he did it anyway. Are you calling that God loving? Spare me. That God would be evil, manipulative. That God would just look at the, the suffering that is caused and just grin and laugh. Like, hey, didn't you guys do that? You guys do this. <laughs> Think of this illustration. If we want to go the free will route, which we'll talk about at length next week, it's our decision that, that drowned us in sin. Picture a, a little kitty pond. And a, a little toddler walked up to the edge and and sees a, a ducky floating in, in there, placed in there by his father. And the kid, you know, tries to reach for the ducky and falls in and starts drowning. Where's dad? Standing there watching it happen. Who's responsible for that child's death? You can be honest. The father is. It's God's fault. Let's make this 
even worse. We are saved by Christ, by grace, through faith in Him alone, correct? Who can earn salvation? Who is the one who does the work of salvation? God. Does God do 99.99% of the work and we contribute 0.01? No. God does everything. God is the one who gives faith. God is the one who holds on to faith. God is the one who brings faith to its completion in, in the waters of baptism. God is the one who brings salvation. It's God doing 100% of the work. If God does everything, why are some people damned? Why do some people go to hell and some go to heaven? God chooses the one to go to heaven. They didn't have anything to do with it. Did he just not like that guy? <coughs> the choice to believe and not believe. Who is the one who gives the power to say yes to God? The Holy Spirit. I can only say yes because of the Holy Spirit. If I don't have the Holy Spirit, I can't say yes. Why doesn't God give the Holy Spirit to everyone? But you can say no. But you can say no? You can't say yes, but you can say no. You can say no if the Holy Spirit wants you. <clears throat> Do you guys see the, 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 the nature of this problem? I can't tell you how many sleepless nights I've spent on this. If I came close to denying the faith and, and giving it all up one time, and that was wrestling with this. But Job says, the Lord giveth, and the Lord giveth, and the Lord So Job says, I'm not Job. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, he went to the box. Yeah. Like, no, right? Yeah. He lost everything. Yeah. Earthly. Yeah. yeah. That's called faith, which mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit works in. But Ultimately, what, so you rest on that Spirit, or you don't. The Holy Spirit doesn't give faith to others, and he lets other people despair. Guys, I'm, I'm being kind of a jerk right now. <laughs> because I really want you to wrestle with this. If you don't see that this is a serious problem, then you can't have comfort. You can't have truth. I, I think this is the most important question that every Christian will ask themselves. And I'm forcing you to ask it of yourself forcing you to. What are we going to do about the problem of evil? German philosopher Leibniz, Leibniz, L-E-I-B-N-I-Z. Leibniz, does that name familiar to anyone else? Mathematicians? Leibniz invented calculus, right? He was also a philosopher, right? So that's just proof that philosophy is the root of everything. Um, so German philosopher Leibniz was the first to coin the term theodicy. Theodicy, T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y, I messed that up, T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y, Theodicy, right? Theodicy is a word um, formed from two Greek words, theos, which is God, and dikaios, which is justice or righteousness. So theodicy is literally God just, or just God. A theodicy is a response to the problem of evil. We, in our discussion just now, and it's going to get worse than once we go on, we just put God on, on trial. We said, God, what's going on? Are you who you say you are, or are you a liar? The God of Christianity is on trial. And we are his his lawyers. We exercise theodicy. Do you guys just all talk about theodicy? Free will, choice, solves the problems ultimately <coughs> man. Those are all theodicies. And the word I'm going to be phrasing I'm going to be using uh, for the next six weeks extensively is theodicies are attempts to get God off the hook. A lot of Christian apologists, when they talk with atheists or agnostics, or they, and they try to convince them that Christianity is the way, the truth, and the light, um, the problem with evil is, is a big sticking point for the world. 
You'll hear it everywhere. And so theodicies are attempts to show that God is justified in what he's doing. That yes, God is good, yes, God is powerful, yes, evil exists, and it's all okay. Alright? Does that make sense? A theodicy is a way, an attempt, to get God off the hook. He's kind of embarrassing. This problem is really embarrassing for the Christian, honestly. It's, it's troubling. I don't have a good answer when I talk to someone who is struggling with it. It's, it's tough. So theodicy are ways to use reason, to use logic, and get God off the hook, trying to find a solution to the problem of evil. Does that make sense? All right? This class will explore two main categories of theodicies as we work to establish a solution to the problem of evil. Um, as of late, in the last 150 years or so, there have been many philosophers and theologians who have come up with uh, a multitude of different theodicies. I, I've studied them, I've, I've read them, I've talked with them. Uh, there's a bunch of theodicies out there. There's a bunch of ways that theologians have come up with for getting God off the hook for the problem of evil. There are resolutions to the problem, right? Now, these all, I think, I can make this argument, can be boiled down into two basic categories of uh, theodicy. Um, one category is going to be the free will theodicy. The second category is going to be the soul-making theodicy. And we're going to spend the next six weeks, five weeks, week six is, is where the gospel comes. We're going to spend the next five weeks, four weeks after today, <laughs> completely dismantling these theodicies. I will work to show you how both of these theodicies, both of these main representations of all of man's answers to the problem of evil, ultimately <laughs> fail. Alright? This process may not be all that pleasant or satisfying. It's, it, it's not going to be. So why am I doing this? From what I heard earlier back when we were talking about is this a problem for you or not, I heard a lot of good answers. Sounds like you've got some solutions to the problem of evil that you've, you've uh, maybe even taught over the years or maybe you've come to, come to believe. Um, why wouldn't I just let you have those and be done with it? Why do I have to be the big, bad, big bad vicar and come in and make you think about things that maybe you've never thought about before? You're evil. <laughs> so I will wear black. Um, I, I, I was thinking really thinking about this, and that the same accusation, the same actually that I've heard from my peers, from other people, is that I'm just, I don't care. I couldn't care less about how you feel, I couldn't care less about what you think, I just want to blast you over the head and hit you until you uh, believe what I think is true. First of all, it's not what I think is true, it's the truth of scripture. Second of all, it's because I do care about you greatly. I had the same argument when uh, talking with some people after my hope class and pounding over the head that hope we hope in Christ, not in dying and being with Jesus. My reason for doing that is the same reason for doing this class. It's because comfort and peace comes with truth. Nothing else. I came up with an illustration um, when I was talking with my wife about this. Um, it's on a battlefield and uh, you suffer a gunshot wound. And the medic comes running over to you, and, and you're, you're hemorrhaging blood, you're, you're bleeding out. And the medic very quickly slaps on a, a patch of gauze till the bleeding stops, and then automatically sews up the wound right away, there on the field. You stop bleeding, right? I mean, the wound is healed, it's gonna heal over with skin, you may have a scar there, but you're going to not bleed out. You're not going to die there on the field. It's a good thing. It patches up the problem right away. How long is it going to take until that bullet that is still in there begins to fester, cause major problems inside? <coughs> if you don't treat the wound right, you may end up with, you may lose whatever body part it is on. For me, a theodicy is, is a quick fix. A theodicy is a patch that covers the wound of the problem of evil and stops the bleeding right away. But all theodicies are man-made. 
all theodicies come from a broken rationality. And when the devil comes knocking, and he starts twisting that bullet around, and making that wound worse than it ever was, what do you have to show in his face? A man-made conception of how God is justified? That wound that was, you know, the bleeding stopped right away, that's true. But give it time and it's going to kill you. I've seen it happen. Contrast that with the doctor who goes in and works to stop the bleeding or, or slow the bleeding at least. And what does he have to do to make sure that wound heals properly? He has to make the wound bigger. He goes in there, he cuts open a little bit, digs around, it, it bleeds a lot. It hurts a whole heck of a lot more than if he had just put a patch over it. But you go in there and you dig around and you find every single shred of lead that's stuck in there. <coughs> and you yank it out and there's going to be blood and it's going to hurt. But that wound is going to heal. Truth goes in and truth doesn't care about how you feel. It really doesn't. It goes in and it makes the wound bigger. It removes every single shred of doubt, every single shred of that problem, and it completely eradicates it. It feels like you're dying. But given time, I'm confident that truth will not let you down. The truth of Scripture brings true comfort. The truth of Scripture brings true hope. This class, it may be opening up a wound that you've never knew no one was there. It may be re opening up a wound that you've been struggling with recently. And there's going to be blood. It's going to hurt. I want you to wrestle with it. But I'm doing this because the truth is more important, is more efficacious at healing a broken person than any man-made theodicy. My ultimate goal of this class is to leave you with nothing, absolutely nothing, but the truth. Because it's only the truth of Christ and the cross that brings comfort and joy. It is only the truth of Christ and the cross that brings comfort and joy. And I'm serious about that. I'm really not going to have any patience after week three, four, yeah, Who's going to teach the week three, I will be here. Tell her I will. <laughs> so will my child. <laughs> Now, what I'm about to say is critically important. It does not look very good on my record if I, as a vicar, cause people to leave the church. <laughs> but that's not why I'm about to say what I'm about to say. I genuinely care about you. And if anything I've said today or anything that I'm going to say in the coming weeks causes you to bleed out and you feel like you're about to pass out and lose faith and just die. Please come to me. Please reach out. I want to talk with you about this. Alright? Truth being brings healing and comfort in Christ. And I do not want you to leave here in despair. Let's turn to Psalm 77. If you have your Bibles with you, Psalm 77. I think a lot of you have Bibles. Uh, those of you that don't, maybe look on with someone else. Um, but I'd like to read this whole verse by whole verse. I'll start with verse 1. You guys can read verse 2. And after verse 20, we will pray. Psalm 77. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. When 
When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyes open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart, that my spirit may be filled with search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? And I have said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O oh God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for bringing us to a Sunday where your good gifts are poured out in word and sacrament for us to hear and for us to eat and drink. Lord, we struggle with evil, we struggle with pain, and we're terrified. But we trust in you. We know that you will hold our eyes open, that we may see your truth, your truth that hung on a cross. Lord, in the days of old, you led your people by the hand of Moses and Aaron, but this day you lead to us by the hand of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us live in that reality this week. Let us serve you with joy and gladness. Lord, all these things we ask in the name of him who died for us. Amen. Have a good weekend.